Hello, I'm the Game Professor, and welcome to Games as Lit 101. It's time we talked about something. Normally, I try to let this show's premise and my commentary speak for itself on issues regarding the basic nature and value of video games as a medium, but some issues deserve a direct look, so today we're finally giving one to a very hotly contested topic in modern gaming, the idea of bringing politics into games. But to really understand this discussion, we're going to need to take a little dive into the history of video games, culture wars, and what I like to call video game apologetics. Video games have been controversial in the public eye practically since their inception. Much of the discussion was sourced in an assumption that video games are a waste of time, something I know most of my generation grew up hearing from our elders quite regularly. But the controversy really ramped up as games became more detailed and more violent. The discussion began centering on the idea that playing a violent game had the potential to exacerbate or even outright create violent tendencies in children. The combination of these two ideas, that video games represented potential harm while giving no positive value in return, was what drove much of this controversy. So it's no surprise that the gaming community and industry fought primarily against these two ideas. So while video games began developing as an art form all on their own, much of the discourse surrounding games as art blossomed out of a need to prove that video games had value, and that, as a result, violence had a place in video games just like any other art form. As a form of video game apologetics, this position seeks to raise the discussion and perception of video games so that all that discourse surrounding it has to acknowledge the complexity of the issue and can't just look at video games as negative, but recognize that there is also a positive there. At the same time, there was one other fairly common voice trying a different tactic. It could perhaps best be summed up as, it's just a game. This approach to video game apologetics hoped to respond to allegations that games could cause harm by essentially downplaying their ability to have any effect at all. If video games can't affect us in any way, then they can't reasonably be criticized as causing harm. These two approaches are, of course, inherently opposed to one another. To understand video games as art necessitates that they be capable of affecting us, as shaping and reflecting culture is one of art's primary functions on a sociological level. On the other hand, the it's-just-a-game approach argues that video games can't affect us at all, because then they can't be argued to cause harm. The two approaches contradict each other on a very deep and inherent level. Over time, though, the first approach won out. As video games began telling more worthwhile stories and tackling more complex ideas, and the discourse surrounding the medium became increasingly sophisticated, it became harder for official investigations and court cases to ignore, and video games have become more widely recognized as a form of artistic expression worth protecting. But as that approach won over the general public, the other one never really went away. It sort of faded into the background a little bit, but it's been making a resurgence these last few years. The sentiment to keep politics out of video games is essentially an extension of the it's just a game approach to video game apologetics. It's an attempt to wave off criticism of the medium not by elevating video games, but by stripping them of meaning and power. The circumstances and nature of this argument's resurgence give us some valuable insight into the reasoning behind it, and that's what I'm hoping to get into today. What brought this mindset back into the limelight, and what are some of the underlying beliefs about video games and culture that inform it? Well, now that we've established the background, it's important to know exactly what this mindset is and what its implications are. So, what does keep politics out of games really mean? It's worth pointing out that the word politics is more colloquial than literal in this case. This sentiment doesn't just apply to ideologies about how government should be run, it also applies to a wide variety of social issues and cultural beliefs. Also important to recognize is that this sentiment is more often directed at game critics or journalists than it is at game developers. Not to say it's never leveled at game developers, but more often than not it's someone who's writing about a game, or about games in general, who is accused of injecting their own personal politics into it. That detail is important because it implies an underlying belief that video games are inherently apolitical unless a developer openly and intentionally puts a political agenda into their game, at which point they usually do come under fire from this position, a video game has no political messaging at all until someone comes along to interpret the game in a way that serves their own political ends. 
So at the core of this call to keep politics out of video games, we have a belief that video games, in general, as a medium, inherently have no political alignment or message unless it's intentionally put into it by a developer with an agenda, or intentionally read into it by a critic or journalist with an agenda. And of course, that any of these ways of changing that inherently apolitical nature of games is the wrong thing to do. But to really understand this mindset, it's not enough to just look at what it is. We also need to understand the circumstances surrounding its recent resurgence, and that's where things really start to clear up. It's important to keep in mind the nature of this mindset as a form of apologetics. We certainly can extrapolate a full worldview of video games, if you will, from it, but it rose out of a perceived necessity to protect video games from people who sought to silence or control them. And that context is ultimately the most important thing to understanding how this mindset manifests on a practical everyday level. I'm going to go ahead and step to the side a second here just to acknowledge that this isn't always a conscious mindset or motivation or thought process. Uh, discussing video games as art, for instance, isn't always done in defense of the medium. The pursuit of more diverse, meaningful, and culturally aware games is its own pursuit, and defending the medium is far from the only reason to talk about it. Similarly, most people, when asked why they want to keep politics out of video games, will simply say that they don't want their fun ruined by a political agenda, or that they don't want video games ruined by the perceived creative demands of an SJW mindset. Now, you'll notice that both of these responses still frame the entire issue as a defense of video games against people who are trying to ruin them one way or another, but even taken on their own terms, these reasons just don't hold up. Art has always had the freedom, and some would even argue the responsibility, to include social and political commentary. And for that matter, the social and political beliefs of the artist usually come through in the art they create, regardless of whether they necessarily are trying to put it there. That's just always how that's worked. So to demand that the entire medium of video games abandon this essential element of its artistic nature? Just because you don't like some of the things they have to say is childish and absurd. So. No, there's something deeper than this, another reason why this mindset persists so much. It's no coincidence that this approach to video games made its big comeback during the same time as the manifestation of Gamergate. Both are inherently reactions against specific forms of video game criticism that they perceive to be a threat against video games. Except that in reality, the criticism we have now is very different from the kind that we had to defend ourselves from before. Criticism of video games in the first two decades or so of their existence came primarily from outside the gaming industry and community. Religious communities, conservative lawyers, and concerned parents saw games as a threat to their children and their idea of propriety and social order, for a number of reasons, and this criticism of video games focused on finding reasons why games should be considered harmful. This often resulted in attempts to bring them under government control. The only reason that didn't actually happen, in America at least, there are still some nations battling this, is because courts eventually became convinced of the medium's artistic worth and labeled such government intervention as censorship. This was an undisputed win for video games, and it was accomplished by convincing people of the value of the medium, not by downplaying its effects. But we don't talk about toys the same way we talk about art. So as our understanding of video games made that switch, so did the discourse surrounding them. We stopped just talking about how fun a game is and how pretty the graphics make it look, and started talking more about how video games interact with us as human beings and as a culture and a society. This, of course, brings the discourse into the path of a variety of sociopolitical issues, and some people notice that when you start looking at video games in this light, there are some improvements to be had. So the criticism began anew. But this criticism was fundamentally different from before. Whereas the previous criticism that we had to defend from came from outside of the video game industry and community, this comes largely from the inside, from people who love and understand video games, but see things that they think need improvement, rather than from a place of ignorance from people who feel threatened by video games as a whole. But nonetheless, this was what ultimately brought this idea back in a really big way. People responded to criticisms that games weren't inclusive enough, or relied on violence too much, or didn't treat women with enough basic human respect, with the old apologetics of, it's just a game. These things couldn't actually matter if games couldn't actually affect us in the first place.
Except this time the arguments were more nuanced, more specific. These critics weren't coming from a place of ignorance and making sweeping generalizations about video games and the harm they could cause. They were approaching video games from very specific and informed viewpoints. Everything from gender issues, to racial issues, to women's issues, to political issues, all kinds of socio-political topics made their way into game criticism. Because video games are an art form, and that's how we started talking about them. But a lot of people don't see any difference between this criticism and the criticism of old. They just see someone looking at video games, at something we love, and saying there's something wrong with them, often something that they don't agree with regarding various social issues. So they reframe the discussion. Games aren't the problem, it's the people bringing politics into them and making problems where they don't actually exist, and that's what has to stop. So when it comes down to it, the approach that views video games as an art form and the approach that views them as a fun pastime with no deeper meaning come from the same place, sort of, on a historical level. Both are rooted to one degree or another in an attempt to protect the medium from people who threaten its freedom of expression. But once that threat is over, and let's be clear, it is mostly over at this point, only one of these two approaches still serves in the best interest of video games and everyone who interacts with them. Viewing video games as a form of artistic expression seeks to elevate the medium, to find worth and value in it, and encourage it to create even more. On the other hand, the idea of keeping socio-political discussions out of video games entirely seeks to do the opposite, to devalue video games until the question of their ability to cause harm is just a moot point. Both theoretically stand to counter ignorant criticism of the medium's harmful effects, but the approach that seeks to deny the value of video games so it doesn't have to deal with criticism is a cowardly approach that actively does harm to our perception of video games and everything we have to gain from them. Believing that something has value, that it can do good, also requires acknowledging that it could be used to cause harm. And it comes with a responsibility to recognize things that cause harm and to work to try and make it better, to concentrate this force for good. So rather than stand for the value of what we do, we just deny it wholesale the moment we face opposition. Because in a weird, twisted way, it's easier to feel good about our relationship to video games when we believe that they are, in fact, completely worthless. Theoretically, we should feel better about all the time and energy we invest into video games if we believe that they matter and can make a difference, that there's something positive to be gained from them. But believing that they can make a difference also requires acknowledging that they could make a difference for the worse. So instead, we retreat to the idea that they're worthless, because at least then, no one can say we're doing anything bad. It's a low-stakes, low-reward approach to video game apologetics. It doesn't seek to better video games, to explore the good they can do. It abandons the concept wholesale that video games can have any kind of impact so that no one can claim that impact could be negative. <laughs> and that's not how we should be doing this. Putting walls around our love of video games can make us feel better about them and about ourselves, but it doesn't help video games grow. So if you want to take the easy way out, protect yourself from thinking more critically about this medium, and even try to stop others from doing so, I, I can't stop you. But video games are capable of doing some pretty great things, and they sure aren't going to get there by devaluing them for the sake of feeling better about ourselves. So let's not keep politics out of games. Let's use games like any other art form. Use them to explore the human experience, to communicate ideas, to ask questions about our world, and to make that world better. Because video games have that potential, and we have to be responsible enough to take them there. That's how we make them, and our world, better. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you really like what this show is doing, then please consider heading over to Patreon and supporting it so that I can continue putting more effort into this series. Don't forget, I have an analysis of Halo 2 coming up, and I'm hoping to see you there. So until then, class dismissed.